Well, good morning. Good morning. Beautiful day out there. A little hot, but uh, it is August, so uh, it's all right. And again, I'm glad you're here this morning. I'm glad I get to be here this morning. Again, if you're visiting with us, uh, you're welcome. Uh, don't put you on the spot or anything. Just uh, everything is pretty much in this order of worship. If you just follow along and join in with us, we'd love to have a record of your visit. There's some cards in the back of the pews, not just for visitors to fill out. It's, uh, uh, and I won't come around and bug you. I would never call. I would call first. Uh, but it's just to fill out, help us learn your name and, and, and get your address and stuff and send you a nice letter about offering our services to you. But also there's a place there for visitation needs if you do want to visit uh, or if, uh, if you have prayer requests to use those and put them in that offering box, which is uh, on the back wall back there and put them in there a little bit, a bit later, not to forget those. As far as our life together this morning, that's our announcements just to go over a few things uh, today. Uh, talking about prayer requests this week, which is the top of the inside of that page there. Matt Bolger uh, had called me. Uh, he is with Campus uh, Outreach at USA Campus. And this is their big push this week. In fact, I noticed it was on the news this morning. I, got, I watched the 7 o'clock news before I come in, watch the, the, the headlines. This is move-in day at USA for all the freshmen and everybody coming back. And uh, Campus Outreach, which is a Christian organization reaching college athletes and young people, uh, help unload the cars for freshmen and get them to their rooms and uh, invite them to Bible studies and prayer time. So it's their, their big, big outreach. They've got activities all this week for them. Later on, there's a couple things for the athletes when they meet, uh, putting on a dinner for all the freshman athletes and those kind of things. So he'd ask for your prayers. We support them, by the way, that ministry. So you have a part in a evangelistic ministry of making disciples of young college students on USA campus is one of the many organizations we support. So another way we can support them not only financially is, is by praying for them. So think about all those freshman college students uh, moving back and, and uh, their opportunity there to, to maybe point them to Jesus Christ. Council meeting today following our morning, uh, our, our morning service. Uh, all of you who are thinking about membership, new members, uh, please we'll put you up front. But uh, we're going to meet in the old kitchen back here, which is the adult Sunday school uh, room, because we have more room there uh, to meet for this instead of the round table room. So if you'll meet in that old kitchen back here uh, right after the service and we'll take care of that. Wednesday, uh, again, our back in full swing, fellowship suffer, come out and have something to eat. We have classes for all ages. You don't have to stay for the classes. I always say that, uh, you know, but if you want to just come and eat, time of fellowship, meeting with people, uh, come on out and enjoy a meal and some time of fellowship with us. And of course, there's opportunities uh, for class. Uh, Monday, on the back of your, mark in your calendars, just point out Monday, August 26th, something we're going to try new. That's a Monday night. August 26th is a game night, all ages. Okay, all ages. Uh, bring your favorite uh, finger food, a game, a board, card game, etc., and uh, join us for a fun time. We'll again at 6 p.m. in the Christian Center, and child care will be provided. So, guys, if you need a cheap date night, you know, drop the kids off in the nursery, and you know, it won't cost you much money, you know. So, okay, but uh, uh, August the 26th, and again, looking forward to our calendar a reminder that September 3rd is our, our ladies' uh, Bible study uh, program. Again. A point about uh, uh, Sunday morning breakfast. We have a breakfast at 8:30. Uh, if you that way, you don't have to get up and rush around. Just come on in, join the Sunday school class. Uh, as far as the adult Sunday school class is concerned, uh, we start a new quarter in two weeks. I'm going to be passing out the new Sunday school materials next Sunday. So if you want to jump in with some new Sunday school materials uh, and, and participate in the uh, adult Sunday school class, and of course we have classes for all ages too on Sunday morning, invite you to do that. Uh, one thing the senior adult Sunday school class has that nobody else has, large print. <laughs> Okay, so if you want some large print Sunday school materials, come on out for that, that class. Remember the blessing box each week, it's, it is being put to work, and, and people do notice that. In fact, we received a donation this week from Zion Lutheran, contributing to uh, the food that we put in the, uh, the, uh, the donation box out there. And please remember to uh, silence your cell phones this morning. They don't uh, accidentally uh, go off. Oh, and I had an announcement this morning. Ruth has an announcement, almost forgot. Yes, 
So um, as you all know, the kids started back with school. Most of them started this past week and the week before. So we've done this a couple of couple of years now. Um, but on Wednesday night, I had all of our Wednesday night kids fill out these All About Me papers. Just their name, how old they are, what grade they're in, and that kind of a thing. And what we'd like to get you to do is to sponsor one of them to pray for them this school year. Um, I've also attached a little extra reference sheet, the ABCs for praying for students. And just the first few ones, attitude, boldness, courage, and there's Bible verses that goes along with those. But as you all know, that's the most important thing that we can do um, for the kids is to just remember them in prayer. So it gives you something to hang on to, stick in your Bible. Um, if you wouldn't mind, wh whoever would like to um, commit to doing that, they're in the back on the back table as you go out today. You just pick up one and, um, and just remember them in prayer as they start this, this school year. Thank you. Okay, what else am I forgetting this morning? Got to be forgetting something. Really? Okay. All right, let's uh, begin our time together as we always do to change from all that's going on and all that busyness is good, but now we need to tend our hearts and attention to the Lord. So let's take a little bit of time of silent prayer this morning. However you need to prepare your heart this morning as we uh, begin to come to worship God, turn our thoughts and attentions to Him. Let's take some time and let us pray. You would take your order of worship, and there's a memory verse. Every month we get a new memory verse. And again, these are some of your favorite verses. We're still working off that uh, list that we sent around uh, more than a year ago. So uh, some of the verses that were in there of your favorite verses. So if you say with me that reference before and after, Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. If you would take your hymnals now and turn to page 346 to begin with, we have a responsive call to worship on page 346, entitled, This is Love, 346. And then if you found page uh, 346 and stick your finger, come back a few pages to uh, page number 319, Near the Cross. 319, Near the Cross. And if you've got a finger stuck there and you have it open to 346, This is Love, I invite you to stand with me this morning if you can or if you're able. Because of His great love for us, 
God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. Please be seated. Again, as I've told you before, oops, I have my mic on. That is an old Fanny Crosby hymn, a lady who couldn't see, who was blind. And I've told you before, when we sing Fanny Crosby songs, I always look to some reference that she has to sight and being able to see because she couldn't. But uh, again, bring the scenes before me. The scenes of the cross to a lady who's loved. I'll watch and 
and wait. And she's waiting for there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around me. A spiritual insight. Maybe being blind, she saw more than a, a lot of folks who, who do have eyesight. Again, our scripture reading this morning, taken from the book of Psalms, verse 34, verses 9 through 14. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles or your pew Bibles there, just a few verses this morning in the litany of the church. This is the scripture reading for this day, Psalm 34, 9 through 14. And there we read, Fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and weary, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Please turn to number 553 and stand as we sing, Nearer My God to Thee.
Please be seated. Before we approach God's word this morning and uh, dismiss our children to their time together, let us uh, turn to the Lord in prayer as we begin our time. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you that we can come here this morning, be together as your children, dear Lord, how you've gathered us out of the world that in the course of our lives. Again, that I'd end up here this morning, that we would all end up here this morning, sharing this beautiful morning, this beautiful place that was prepared for us again by those who went before us. That we can just come and spend time thinking about you, dear Father, your love for us, dear Father, and our need to grow near to you because of your love. Thank you, dear Father, for this privilege and this honor. So many can't this morning. Again, some sick, some at home, some can't get out anymore. Again, we remember them this morning as we get together here. We pray for them. We pray your Holy Spirit guide and lead us in your truth and speak into lives. Even as we've lit these candles this morning, symbolic of the illumination of your Holy Spirit that you would illumine us. And as we gather here and look into your word, we pray for those at home and hospital, dear Lord, and sick, that your spirit minister to them in special ways, that they too know your presence, dear God, for healing, for strength, for encouragement, dear Lord, for a joy and a peace that only can come from you by your sweet, sweet spirit. We pray that this morning for them as well. Guide us in your word. Without your guidance, dear Lord, and direction is all for nothing. Give us eyes to see what it is that you would take and apply to our lives, but not for selfish reasons. Help us to study these things that we might be better able to help others around us, dear Lord, and better able to point them to you, that they too might know that unspeakable joy and a shalom, a peace that this world and nothing in it can take away. We would pray that too this morning for all of our churches here in, in our community of Silver Hill, uh, throughout the county, throughout our state, throughout the world this morning, that your gospel is preached with the power of the Holy Spirit. And men, women, and children finally, maybe after resisting for many years, would finally bow their hearts, humble themselves, and receive your free gift of salvation. We pray this day for folks to get saved, dear Father. Guide us now in your holy word. Thank you for teaching us. Thank you for the way you tutor us in our lives, dear Lord, guiding us along the way. Thank you for growing us. And again, we pray that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, our young people, with their helper this morning for their time together and their lesson this morning can be dismissed at this time. Now, this is our eighth sermon in Job. Uh, I have about 15 messages we're going to teach out of Job. There are 42 chapters in Job. To give you an idea, I'm just gleaning the top here. And I know poetry is hard. I mean, how many of you love Shakespeare in high school? Okay, it, a po Hebrew poetry is even worse than Shakespeare. And it's, it's I, so, very few, right? But, but, but it's tough, and I realize that. But, I, but poetry, I can't read for you. You know, I mean, you've got to experience. Poetry is meant to evoke an emotional response in you. And it's what you see in that poetry and how it speaks in to your life, which is why we have a lot of Hebrew poetry in Scripture. So I'm just touching the surface this morning as we're gleaning through. Uh, last time, we looked at the reply, Job's reply to the old of, of his three friends, Eliphaz, remember? Eliphaz was the man of experience. As I have observed Job, based on my experience and a dream that I experienced, those who plow evil and those who sow trouble reap it. And Job's reply to Eliphaz and the others present was a plea to understand his anguish. A plea to just listen to what I'm saying. And he concluded in a prayer. In Job 6, 2 through 4, Job replied, If only my anguish could be weighed and all my misery be placed on the scales, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. The arrows of the Almighty are in me. My spirit drinks in their poison. God's arrow terrors are marshaled against me. That's the way he felt. 
and complaining about what had fallen on him in an attempt to get his friends to just listen to him and try to understand, it sounded a little like he was saying that God was not fair or God was not just to his friends. He wasn't saying that, but that was the implication. See, according to their theology, in, in, in the, and the things that had happened to him, they could not have happened without a cause. If they had happened without a cause, then God would be unjust. So Job, you must be a truly great sinner because God is just. There's this cause and effect relationship. We're going to talk about that. If you, Job, deny that you are a great sinner, you're impugning the judgment or the justice of God. This dialogue is a result of what Job's friends think they know about God. They put God in a box. God is not bound to act in accordance with any theology book. He's bigger than that, and he doesn't fit in any theology book. And there's a danger when we think we put him in one. Then he's under our control. A life as built that involves say many correct things revealed about God that are true, but it's not the whole truth about God, let alone Job's situation. One attribute of God they do not approach is his sovereignty. God is sovereign and dispenses and disposes that which brings glory to himself and is not obligated to give an account to men. He can do anything he wants, anytime he wants to, as many times as he wants to, because he's God. And he doesn't owe us an explanation. God out of the box. One problem that Job's three friends are having is, their God is too small. Now I borrowed that from J.B. Phillips' book that was written many, many years ago. A problem he saw in the church of the church worshiping a little God. Second, their puffed up heads, pride. They think they have an exhaustive knowledge of God and they know about Job's situation, insisting they are right and Job is wrong. It's called religious pride, the most dangerous kind of pride there is. Thirdly, they're afraid. They're afraid thinking that if what Job is saying is true, then what happened to him could happen to us. Oh no, we can't have that. An out-of-the-control God. A God that does not conform to our theology. A God that is out of the box. You see, we're doing good, so God owes us good, right? We can put Him in our debt, right? That's what Job's three friends want. And Job is attacking that, and he doesn't even know it. And they're terrified. All this speechifying, I called it, is trying to harmonize all of these different ideas to explain Job's suffering. Yes, God is just. Yes, sin is punished and righteousness is rewarded. But what they don't know is that what came upon Job was because he was righteous. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil and he still maintains his integrity though you incite me against him to ruin him without any reason. There's not a cause and effect. Remember the behind the scenes encounter that brought all this on. Satan's assessment of mankind was the only reason they serve and worship you God because of what's in it for them. That's Satan's assessment of us by the way. In uh, Job chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 Satan says to God, does, does Job fear God, reverence God for nothing? Have not you put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face, God. Job worships you because of the benefit he receives. Satan is saying that the only reason that we worship God is because of what's in it for us. An insurance policy. And like I told you before, that's the way pagans worship gods. Their gods, they would go to the temple when they needed something or wanted something, make a sacrifice, give money, donate a child sometimes to pagan temples. Then that god was obligated to do what they wanted. Now that begs another question. 
Will a man worship and serve God just because he's God? Will a man worship God for nothing? Now, Bildad, the historian here, now speaks. The second person in these three rounds of speeches. Job listens. Uh, he tells Job, listen to what history teaches. See, ask the former generations, Job. Find out what the ancestors learned from history. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing. Our days on earth are but a shadow. Will they not instruct you and tell you? See, what do what does the historians teach? Will they not bring forth words from their understanding? That's Job chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Bildad will accuse Job of impugning the justice of God, insinuating that God is unfair. Job 8.3, does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? That's what you're saying, Job. And Job, no, I'm not saying that. To Bildad, it seemed that if you are saying what Job is saying is true, that all this happened to him for no good reason, and that it's not because he's a truly great sinner, then you're saying that God is unfair and unjust. God is always right. God is always just, even in Job's case, because he is sovereign, almighty God. That's what we don't get. Life has had accused God of resenting God's discipline for his sin. Both of Job's comforters turned counselors held the view that a man's troubles are the consequences of his sin. Bildad and Eliphaz will invite Job to repent of his sin, which is part of Job's dilemma that we studied. But he wanted to know, what is my sin? And, and if I have sinned, he's already asked forgiveness from God, he said. But I don't know why this has happened to me. That's his question. He was desiring to be heard and understood and comforted by his friends. Not necessarily hit over the head with the Bible or hit over the head with their theology. Let me talk about his accusation. Then Bildad the Shuat replied, How long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. That also tells you he wasn't listening to him. What Job said is like wind. You ain't got it wrong. He wouldn't listen. Job just wants them to hear him. He says, does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. That's harsh. In other words, God killed your children because of their sin. That's not why what fell upon them. But if you will seek God earnestly, he tells him, plead with the Almighty, which he has been. If you are pure and upright, even now he will rouse himself on your behalf, restore you to your prosperous state. Your beginnings will seem humble, so prosperous will be your future. You know, Bildad, Bildad begins bluntly asking Job two questions. One about Job's windy, blustering words. How long, Job, are you going to go on with your windy, blustering, defending yourself and asking why of God? The second is pertaining to God's governing the world. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? Upright management of the moral universe. That's what he's questioning. In saying Job's words are like a blustering wind, Bildad was probably picking up on Job's own reference to wind. In Job 6.26, he says, Do you mean to correct what I say and treat my desperate words as wind? There's a lot of word plays going on here when you talk about poetry. His friends are taking the same words he says, changing them a little bit, and throwing them back at him. Okay? That's what's happening here in the Hebrew. You don't see it so much in the English. Also, wasn't it wind that destroyed his children? See the play on the words here? And that's the way Hebrew poetry works. In all this world day. And again, Bildad is hinting that Job's words, which to him it made it sound like he was implying that God is unjust, were as destructive as the windstorm that killed his ten children. We read in Job 119, suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the same word, swept in from the desert, struck the four corners of the houses, it collapsed on them, and they are and, and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped that servant to tell Job. Lots of plays on words, especially in Hebrew poetry. Bildad argued that to complain against God meant that Job was accusing him of injustice. But he wasn't accusing God of injustice. Since God never perverts or distorts justice, he certainly could not be punishing Job for nothing. 
But that's exactly what God said. For nothing. If Job had not sinned, then his suffering would mean that God had perverted his ways. To Bildad, that was unthinkable. Obviously then, the solution is Job had to be a great sinner. Okay? Bildad says that anyone who sins against God suffers the consequences just like your children. Boy, that's cold. He used his own children to illustrate the fact. They died because they sinned, and now Job was dying because he sinned. Obviously. Bildad's counsel to Job was that if he was a pure and upright as he claimed to be, all he needed to do was look to God and plead with him, implore him, and he was doing that. Asking God for why? And God is going to answer him when we get to that chapter a little bit later on down the line. Job had pleaded with God and nothing yet had happened. I mean, he said things like, if I have sinned, this is a Job 7, 20 and 21. If I have sinned, what have I done to you? You who sees everything we do. Why have you made me your target? Have I become a burden to you? Why do you not pardon my offenses and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust. Uh, dust. You will search for me, but I will be no more. Job wants to, would like to know, why is this happening to me? The reason for Job's suffering was not about his sin. But it was because he was an upright man. Bildad's proof then in chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. Ask the former generations. Here's the historian again. Find out what their ancestors learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing. And our days on earth are like a shadow. Will they not instruct you and tell you? Will they not bring forth words from your understanding? You know, Eliphaz had supported his argument in appealing to his own experiences. He was the oldest of the three. You know, even as I have seen and also a dream he had. Bildad supports his argument by the observations of history, by a study of people in the former generations. Since Job and his friends' knowledge was limited, we know nothing, and their lives were short, a shadow may refer to the back to Job's words about life's brevity and how short it is, they could learn a thing or two from the former generation. Learn from history, Job. Bildad says, in essence, how could Job dare suggest that the accumulated wisdom of many others, of historians, is wrong? Those who do right prosper and are healthy, wealthy, and wise, but those who sin are punished, like you, Job. So just learn from history. But they were wrong. He then adds, thirdly, Another illustration in verses 11 through 19 of chapter 8. Can papyrus grow tall where there is no marsh? Can reeds thrive without water? While still growing and uncut, they wither more quickly than grass. Such is the destiny of all who forget God. So perishes the hope of the godless. They that trust in is fragile, or they what they trust in is fragile. What they rely on is a spider's web. They lean on the web, but it gives way. They cling to it, but it does not hold. They are like well-watered plants in the summertime, spreading its shoots over the garden. It entwines its roots around a pile of rocks and looks for a place among the stones. But when it is torn from its spot, that place disowns it and says, I never saw you. Surely its life withers away and from the soil other plants grow. This is Bildad's application of this cause and effect principle. As papyrus wilts without water or a marsh uh, of a marsh, even so a person who opposes God, the godless, profane, they perish. Hint, 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 Job, you're perishing. It's cause and effect, cause and effect, Job. Simple cause and effect. You know, and I've got to stop there because isn't that the way Jesus has been sold, especially the last 40 years in America? Come to Jesus and you'll be healthy, wealthy, and wise and never have any problems. Especially if you put money in the offering plate. Buy an insurance policy. That was their theology, by the way. But it wasn't true of Job. 
Bildad is telling him to depend on any other understanding for hope, like your alleged innocence is useless and inadequate as leaning on a spider's web. Your argument that you're leaning on is as weak as a spider's web. You obviously are a great sinner. Job's withering away. But Job had not forgotten God. Do you see the hypocrisy here? Bildad said of his own words in verse 9, For we were born only yesterday and know nothing. But doesn't Bildad think he knows all there is to know about God and all there is to know about Job? Ah, a little, a little hint here of what's happening in this simple cause and effect theology. It's called pride. He thinks he knows about God. God is bigger than any of us. Okay. We get glimpses from time to time, and we're, we're lucky if our head doesn't explode. And he thinks he knows what's going on in Job's life, but he doesn't really know Job. He's not listening to him. And that's all Job wants, a little understanding. <laughs> and listen to me. Religious people who think they know it all are dangerous and hurtful to other people. What does the Bible say? Well, in the Apostle Paul's doxology, which is rooted in Old Testament scriptures in Romans 11, 33 through 36, he says, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. How searchable are they? They're unsearchable. And his paths are beyond tracing out. Can you figure out his ways, why he does what he does? No, they're past finding out. Who has known the mind of the Lord, why he does what he does? Or, why has, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? You see, you can never put God in your debt. He, he will never owe you anything. He owns everything. He made it all. For him, through him, and for him are all things. To him be glory forever. In Isaiah 40, 13, he writes, Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? In Job 41, 11, God says, Who has a claim against me that I must pay it? Everything under heaven belongs to me. That's what God says. Like I said, you have all this speechifying going on and on and on. It's meant to wear you out as you read these three rounds. Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, Job answering each one of them. Then Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar. Each one answered. Then Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar drops out. Job answers all three of them. Then Elihu speaks in, speaks four speeches in a row. He said, my goodness, when is this going to stop? When we shut up, maybe we'll learn something about God. That's us. Everybody talking about God, saying He does this, He does that. But until you shut up and listen, you won't learn a thing about God. In Scripture, we have substantial revelation about God, but not exhaustive information about Him because He is beyond our capability to understand it all. I told you before, I've been in ministry some 45 years. Two things I know after 45 years of ministry. One, there is a God. Two, I am not Him. It's touching Bildad thinking he knows what's going on in Job's life. 1 Corinthians chapter 2.11 says, For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? And we're not truthful with ourselves many times. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Bildad does not know God's thoughts, and he doesn't know Job's heart. But he thinks he does. That makes him very dangerous. There is a better way, however. In that same epistle to 1 Corinthians, a little later on in chapter 8, Paul will remind us that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Knowledge gives you a big head. Think you know something, most dangerous people of all. But love edifies. It's constructive. What does Job need from his friends? What does he need from Bildad? Does he need a history lesson? Or does he need love and understanding? 
And does that have application to us as a church in the days in which we need? What do sinners need? They need hit over the head with a bunch of theology? Or, or maybe they need love and understanding. Maybe that's a better way. We then have Bildad's solution to Job's dilemma, fourthly and finally this morning. His solution, surely, of a surety. History proves it, Job. God does not reject one who is blameless or strengthen the hands of evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Your enemies will be clothed in shame and the tents of the wicked will be no more. That's if you repent of your sins and quit this foolish argument. Verses 20 through 22. Surely God does not reject the blameless. God hadn't rejected Job. He calls him my servant. If Job were blameless, Bildad contends, God would not be treating him this way. If Job would give up his windy words and repent, he could experience laughter and joy once again. And anyone who opposed him like his enemies would be shamed. But that's Job's dilemma. He doesn't know why all this is happening to him. Job didn't get to see what we were shown in the first chapters of Job. That scene that took place in heaven. All this, we, we were privileged to see the end of the plot, the play. Ironically, or a little poetic justice here, Job's friends, who became his adversaries, his enemies were later themselves shamed, humiliated by God Himself. They're going to end up eating some humble pie served by the Almighty God Himself. You see, jumping ahead in chapter 42, verses 7 through 9, after the Lord has said these things to Job, He said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, that's Bildad so far, because you have not spoken the truth about me. Now they said many things about God, but it wasn't the whole truth about God. He says, you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So now take seven bulls, seven rams, and go to my servant Job. Ooh. Talk about putting your tail between your legs, eating some humble pie. You go to my servant, my servant, Job, and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. That's called like eating crow, isn't it? A little bit of shaming going on there. My servant Job will pray for you, and I will accept his prayer and not deal with you according to your folly. You have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Bildad's words included yet another heartless, not so subtle hint at Job's suffering and his attempt to defend God's justice against Job, when in fact all it does is intensify Job's suffering, intensified his questions about what had happened to him. And by the way, God does not need us to defend his justice. God is fully capable of dispensing and disposing his justice, and he doesn't need us to defend him. In fact, by the way, there is a day of reckoning coming in which all will stand before the judgment seat and all will stand before God. So you want to sort it out with God, then you can do it then. In the meantime, He doesn't need us to defend Him. He's going to do that all on His own. Since Job had not sinned, the words of Bildad were of no help to comfort him. Let me draw a conclusion this morning and putting these thoughts together. William Henry Green wrote this about Job's three friends, and I think it's a good description of it. I can't improve on it. Quote, he says, He is wounded by their harshness, stung by their censures, exasperated by their reproaches, and driven into antagonism by their arguments. They are the professed advocates of religious obligation. They represent the cause of God enforcing His claims on Job and justifying His ways with Him, hitting Job over the head with their religion, which they do in a spirit that repels Him, with assumptions that experience does not sanction and which His own inner conscience falsifies. Here then are Job's three friends, 
busily engaged in letting fly their poison arrows, and here is Job himself exposed without shield or buckler to their dangerous religious attacks against him. Unquote. That's religion. Job's three, fr three friends, so busy defending their religious beliefs that they're right and he's got to be wrong, so busy defending their theology that they failed to listen to Job, to comfort him by just being there with him. We talked about a ministry of presence rather than a ministry of preaching at him. Which brings up another point about religion. When sinners are down, when they fall, why is it that religious folks love to jump on top of them and beat them down even further? Really? Really? Maybe if you want to help them, maybe a little love and understanding might go a long way. Remember I quoted Warren Beersby, Beersby in his uh, B-series. He wrote about Job and grief counseling. He said, the best way to help people who are hurting is just to be with them, saying little or nothing. Letting them know you care. Don't try to explain everything. Explanations never heal a broken heart. If his friends had listened to him, accepted his feelings, and not argued with him, they would have helped him greatly. But they chose to be prosecuting attorneys instead of witnesses. Unquote. Two passages I keep bringing up. James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Not true of Job's three friends. And know this. In 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3-5, through 5, we praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Question this morning is, where does real comfort come from? It comes from the God of all comfort. Too bad Job's three friends didn't present him with that. Point him to God and listen and pray with him with understanding. To the God of all comfort. And notice this verse also gives us another reason why the righteous suffer. Listen again to that 2 Corinthians 1-3 through 3, and I'll close with this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles. Here's the why. Why does He do that? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Wait a minute. So we suffer troubles so God can then use us to comfort others when they have the same trouble? Suffering qualifies us for serving others. It's on-the-job training. I've been there, done that, been hurt, sometimes by religious folks. Now, I'm infinitely qualified to help somebody else. Maybe a better way that I was helped when they fall into that suffering. Someone who understands their hurts is present with them, quietly pointing them to the God of all comfort. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, we do what? We share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ? So also our comfort abounds through Christ. A good comforter knows how to listen. A good comforter points men and women to the God of all comfort. A good comforter can empathize, at least sympathize with them, because they have been there and know their pain and know their questions. They understand and know that love and understanding is the greatest healer. Job's friends? Not so much. Not so much. Let's close with these thoughts this morning. Let's sing.
Please turn to page number 680 and stand as we sing all the way my Savior leads me. remain standing for the words of our benediction this morning taken from the epistle written to the church at Ephesus now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think to him be glory in the church and in G and to Jesus Christ to all generations to all families forever and ever Amen. Oh, 